Well, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to get right to the point today. Our healthcare systems are surging, and our healthcare workers are extremely busy right now with both COVID uh, and non COVID cases. They are managing, but they are busy. They're implementing their surge strategies to deal with this increased demand. And so first off, frontline medical staff, we see you, we notice you, uh, we appreciate the work you're doing right now. But we're in a tense spot. Uh, and quite honestly, we need this region and each of you to do your part. We need more. Our schools need you to do more. Our hospitals need you to do more. Our vulnerable populations need this community, this region to do more. And I have an expectation of residents, and I'm not just talking residents of Sioux Falls, I'm talking to our entire region right now. The majority of the inpatients in our, in our Sioux Falls hospitals are not from Sioux Falls, from all over. This reinforces that there's a level of diligence across this region that we need right now. Approximately 15 to 20% of staffed beds right now are being used for COVID. What that signals is that deferred care is also becoming an increasing issue in our hospitals. Let me stress, if you are over the age of 65, you need to be extra diligent right now. I'm not going to tell you what to do if you're in that age bracket. You need to be diligent. You need to be responsible for your situation. Friday, myself and the mayors of the 16 largest cities in the state, uh, we represent roughly over half of South Dakota's population. We sent out a unified message of what we need from our communities right now from this region. Wear a dang mask when you're indoors. We're not asking you to sign up for the draft here. We're asking you to wear a mask when you're inside and you can't distance. Social distance, take that seriously. We have let down our guard tremendously on that. That needs to be taken seriously. The hand hygiene protocols, this is stuff that shouldn't be a surprise we've been talking about it since march but now we're at the time when we need the diligence on these items you know the current political tensions uh, in this country are certainly impacting this issue um, and impacting us as leaders at a local level part of my job as a leader of this city is to take action as well as to avoid action to ensure we remain as unified as we can right now and avoid division and chaos in a tense local and national dialogue that exists. You're gonna to continue to see strong, strong expectations from myself and those other 16 mayors across the state asking our residents again to do their part. We need you to do your part. This is a chart we're not proud of. This is a trend we need to reverse. You've all seen it, you see it every day. We're getting a lot of attention over our increased hospitalizations, our increase in active cases. This is the trend we have to reverse. So one of the messaging components you're gonna start seeing is this. In, in partnership with Sanford and Avera, we're promoting mask wearing whenever we can. This entire room is masked up you're gonna see a lot of these campaigns in the community. You're gonna see billboards, you're gonna see social media campaigns, you're gonna see PSAs. We need you to mask up right now. And we need you to take that seriously. I am not sure when or why this issue became so dang political. Uh, it's quite ridiculous if you ask me how political this has become. Uh, this is not an R or a D issue. This is a public health issue. And at times I'm embarrassed about how politicized this has become. 
There's a lot of anger right now. There's a lot of fear over this virus. And what I'm asking you to do today as well is try to control that anger and that fear. We will get on the other side of this. But I'm also asking for a level of unselfishness that, quite honestly, many people are not used to giving. That's unselfishness that says, I'll wear a mask for other people. I'll avoid groups. I'll avoid large social gatherings on the weekends. Uh, I'll think of others before myself. And so if you want to live in a state that gives you freedoms, that comes with an expectation of responsibility. And I need this region to do more right now. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Basil with Avera. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that we have seen a significant increase in hospital, hospitalized cases over the last month or so. Probably the numbers have roughly doubled in that time. Um, we have initiated early stages of our surveillance plan. One of the nice things uh, is that we had a good, good run of using our surveillance plan last spring. This time it's going to be more of a stepwise process, and so uh, we're trying to keep as many things open, as many things running at all times, because we can't just keep deferring that care. We've got to make sure that we're doing all those things to prevent strokes, to prevent cancer, to keep, keep people's diabetes under control, all of those things. You know, this has turned into a marathon, not a sprint, and so we've got to keep all of our long-term care going at the same time we're managing these increasing COVID cases. So some of the early stages, some things that we've been doing. So for example, uh, we've opened up more ICU beds. If you'd asked me six months ago, how many ICU beds in your main uh, medical ICU, I would have said 20. Over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've increased that into the mid thirties already. And we plan to increase that further this week to care for those increasing cases. That's one of the reasons why when you asked me, you know, do you have any beds? We've got search plans so that we can ever increase that number of beds to meet that demand. And we're still confident uh, that we have the ability to do that. Um, but there is a limit to that. And so we will keep us stepwise, you know, increasing, um, asking people to work more shifts, being able to handle that surge. We do see ongoing that, you know, all projections are showing we're not done yet. Uh, with the number of cases that we're seeing, the percent positivity that we're seeing out in our communities, that number is going to continue to increase and, and potentially increase pretty significantly over the next month. And so we have plans in place to handle that. But I do agree, uh, Mayor, that we do need the public's help with this. Um, there's a limit to how far we can increase. We also agree that we've got to keep as many things open, our schools, our businesses, our economy, as much as possible. Our ability to do that depends on each and every one of you, and how can you help? Masking is probably first and most important. Masks work. You know, back in February, we didn't know whether masks work for COVID. Now we have solid data, masks work, and they work pretty significantly. Um, the where we're seeing it spread mostly is when people aren't wearing their masks, sitting down at a table together during their lunch break, you know, within the healthcare system. We're not seeing cases getting transferred, you know, between a patient and a healthcare worker. We're seeing it because they sit down in the break room or sit down at a lunch table. Those are some of the changes that we've had to make that's proven to us that masks do work. Because when we're wearing the masks, we don't see the transmission. When we don't, we do. You mentioned large gatherings. That certainly is a time where one person can infect many, but small gatherings are also important, especially now as we're coming indoors as the weather gets colder. You know, an outdoor gathering is certainly less risky than an indoor, and even small groups as you come indoors, think about you know, how you can incorporate masking into that when you get just a few families that come together, how you can reduce the spread in those settings. We flattened the curve this spring. We can do that again now while still keeping as many things open as we can. My kids are in soccer uh, this fall. I want them to be able to continue doing activities like that as long as we all do them safely. Another way that we can help with that 
is if you have even mild symptoms, stay home. There is so much overlap on the milder cases between the common cold and other common mild infections that you really can't tell. There's certain things, if you lose taste and smell, you have COVID. Um, but there's so many other things, you know, mild cough, runny nose, stomach upset, those sorts of things that, that can be COVID and be pretty mild. And so if you have any of those symptoms, don't go to work, don't go to school, get yourself tested so that we can get you ruled out and isolate and isolate until you get that test result back. We are working diligently to increase the turnaround, decrease the turnaround time so that we can get those results back to you quickly for that. And also important is if you are within close contact to somebody who is positive, even though you feel fine, it's so vitally important uh, that you stay away from others and isolate for that 14 day period because it can take five to 14 days for symptoms to show up after a single exposure to somebody who's been positive. And so there's no way of knowing or predicting. You, we can give you a test, but just because that test is negative doesn't mean you're not gonna turn positive later on. And you could start infecting people days before you ever turn symptomatic. So it's so important uh, to stay isolated during that time period. I mentioned uh, that we're trying to improve access to testing and continually increasing the number of tests that we can run on a daily basis. One of the next steps that we have in that process is that we are this week opening up a new testing location for drive throughs at 23rd in Minnesota. So that's an old Vern ID location uh, that was bought by Silver Star and they graciously uh, did a short term lease for us so that we can have another testing location other than our west side location and we can uh, really reduce the wait time for people that need to get that test. And so we're really excited about that ability uh, to reduce the barriers to get uh, testing go through. And so I think that'll be a real step forward for us and for the city. Lastly, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the public that is already doing so much. I was at church this weekend, 90, 95% of the people in church were wearing masks. They're doing their part, thank you. Thank you to all of the workers in grocery stores and other businesses that are working and keeping things running as this goes on and on. But most importantly, I wanna thank you to the healthcare workers, the frontline workers, the support workers who are helping us care for all these patients. Again, we are asking for extra shifts from individuals. We are asking for longer hours from nurses and care techs and social workers and first responders and everybody. And it, it's taken its toll over time, uh, but we stay strong, we stay positive. Sometimes it's hard. These are, there are so many tragic cases that we have to deal with with COVID daily. Families, husband, wife, teams that come down with it and one of them makes it and the other one doesn't. Um, the way it spreads through households and just hits one after another can just be so big of a tragedy. And to healthcare workers, that takes a toll on them. And so thank you for everything you do. You are making a difference and you will continue to make a difference. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Basil and uh, Mayor as well, and good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with a, with a thank you as well. Um, as Dr. Basil pointed out, there's a lot of people uh, in traditional healthcare roles, but also those um, in, in, that teach, those that coach, those that work in the restaurants, grocery stores, et cetera, really stepping up during this time. And uh, sincere thanks to them. Thanks to all those that work within our facilities as well, those folks that are answering the call at all hours, even though they expect, you know, to maybe be able to relax a little bit. And I, I, we absolutely want people to focus on that, but there's times when people will step up as well uh, to help us uh, take care of those coming to us in need. Um, as already stated, we continue to see COVID, but also patients coming to us for non-COVID needs as well. And uh, I've talked now a couple of times about this typically is a busier time of year, and that certainly continues uh, for patients, not only with COVID, but uh, other needs outside of COVID as well. One of those, as the mayor pointed out, being needs that, uh, care needs that perhaps were deferred earlier in the year, 
and uh, now are being addressed and may take a little more complexity in their care to get that addressed at this time. Um, we continue to prioritize really that care closest to home, what makes sense, and a lot of people are working to achieve that as well. Um, a lot of people come to us asking, you know, what can I do? And uh, a, a thanks also, like I said, uh, like everyone has said so far, to those folks that are really engaged in, in uh, helping to fight this pandemic. Um, and, and patients do come to us asking, you know, what can I do? And it's really a, a thanks for listening to the message and being willing to listen uh, with an open mind as to what I can do, even though I may not necessarily be around a lot of patients in my community or a lot of people in my community. Um, we're seeing that, that those populations as well are vulnerable at this time. This virus does get, it does get to visit everywhere. And so some of the things that we see uh, from a hospital standpoint, but just taking care of yourselves, group gatherings has been mentioned. And I, I think now's a good time to probably talk about your holiday plans. Unfortunately, due to this pandemic, um, you, there may have to be some alterations this year. And people just need to, and I have tremendous confidence in people to thoughtfully have a conversation with your families, your loved ones, um, those around you to, hey, what, what, what's Thanksgiving? What's Christmas? What's that gonna look like this year? Do we travel? Do we get together in a large group? Or does it just not make sense right now? Another thing, uh, and, and we, I, uh, we encourage this in times of pandemic, just really any time, and, and that is to focus as a patient on your advanced care planning. You have the ability to make your wishes known at, the, at, at any time during your care. And usually when the care is more acute is maybe not the best time, but rather if you're having a routine follow-up visit with your physician or nurse practitioner or PA, talk to them about your advanced care plan. Does it include hospitalization? Does it include life support or aggressive care like that? Or is it more a focus on comfort? And we have, in our primary care offices, that availability is there to have that thoughtful conversation. I've been involved with many powerful patient interactions where the family may have to step up and make that decision on a loved one's behalf, and it can be really helpful to have those wishes, and it has been really helpful to have those wishes uh, really spelled out uh, as, as those needs may arise. The next thing, if you are, if you do need to be hospitalized, uh, start planning about how a, a discharge from the hospital is going to look. Have conversations with family, loved ones, coworkers, etc. You know, we typically are very trans are able to be very transparent with you during your care as to, hey, uh, it's looking like maybe the next day or two we could probably get out of here. What is how how are you going to get home? Uh, is someone going to come get you? Did you drive yourself? Are you able to drive now? Um, and and just things like that that can really help us as we transition patients from the hospital to the home care setting. And I'll just wrap up with, uh, as I alluded to earlier, really a thanks to everyone who's stepping up during these really challenging times, uh, working hard to, to meet patients' needs as close to as home to pos as possible. We had a very powerful interaction with uh, our Good Sam facilities, Good Samaritan facilities, in addition to our network facilities. As you know, we not only have the facilities here in Sioux Falls, but across the upper Midwest, Western uh, Minnesota, Northern Nebraska, Northwest Iowa, and Eastern, Eastern South Dakota. And we, the, the ask at that time uh, of the network and the Good Sam facilities is what can we do? And, and certainly our network facilities have been caring for patients with needs as they can meet them as close to home as possible. But then some of these folks that we take care of in the hospital here can be difficult to transition to home and they may, just, may need to stay at one of our outlying facilities for a couple of days as they recover. Uh, our, our good SAM facilities uh, stepping up to say, even though we're stressed from a staffing standpoint, we're gonna step up and work with some of these patients as well to help them transition to home. So really a humbling uh, time, uh, a busy time, um, and, and continue to work hard to meet patients' needs. So with that, I'll conclude uh, uh, myself, Dr. Basil and the mayor are here for questions. So the question is, uh, 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 testing, uh, testing opportunities identified in the October 11th, October 11th, to the 11th to the 13th. Okay. 
So we have several analyzers uh, at, uh, at Sanford, not only in the hospital, but in the, uh, our facilities on, on the north side of town. And a couple of those analyzers uh, did, we, we questioned the results and it was actually uh, picked up very early that we could have some uh, erroneous results. And that is being worked through as we speak um, and, and communication with primary care providers to identify uh, patients if testing is still appropriate or what we need to do. Um, and I, I can't speak to where that exactly was located, uh, where those uh, patients that uh, maybe had positive tests were identified. And we still don't know exactly if the positives were true positives or false positives, but it does seem to, it, it was questioned early and uh, those analyzers have since been taken offline for repair. Right, so the question is, uh, are, are we retesting? Um, and, and currently what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have that really up to the, that person's primary care clinician to make that determination if it makes sense for them to test or not, and then offer that if that's the case. And the number of patients is between four and 500 across all of Sanford. The short answer is no. Uh, I'm not, you know, the mayor doesn't control trick or treating, so I'm not, I'm not really going to make any mandates about that. I will ask that I guess people do that safely. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that, whether you just leave your candy out in the front or you, you know, avoid close contact. However, people, I'm, I would guess also there's probably a lot of parents who will just skip the trick or treating this year as well. So I'm asking back to the kind of the theme families to do what they think is best for their family uh, with trick-or-treating. Um, since uh, two weeks ago when you instituted the uh, city staff asking policies, has there been any more outbreaks? I know you talked about uh, six, a five or six person mm -hmm. team who uh, all had to go into quarantine. Yeah, no outbreaks in the city. We continue to see cases here in city employees just like uh, I think a lot of people are, but I would say there's no, been no outbreaks in the city. Uh, I will also say at least in my office, I haven't heard one single piece of negative feedback from employees that we have a mask mandate amongst our employees. So as a business, I would encourage you as businesses to consider the same. Uh, however, there are a lot of negative feedback about masks in general, but not from my employees. Uh, and maybe that's just because they don't uh, reach out to me directly on that. Well, a lot of reasons for that. One is, and I alluded to it in my remarks, is uh, this has become so incredibly polarizing that uh, even if I felt the efficacy was there, it has a chance to absolutely destroy a city. And I've seen it, divide a city. Secondly, it's not enforceable. I don't know how you enforce it. It's not enforceable. I'm not gonna put our cops in a position where they have to enforce mass mandates. Third, we have a high level of compliance in this city on mask wearing. The challenge is the outlying communities is where the challenge is. So this is not a Sioux Falls issue and I can't, can't reinforce that enough. That's why I say region, region, region. Southwest Minnesota, Northwest Iowa, Southeast South Dakota, really the entire state. So this is bigger than just Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, and so there are a lot of people uh, who take their personal freedoms very seriously in this state and they take their responsibility for those personal freedoms seriously and I'm in agreement with that and so there's not a mask mandate uh, on the table in the near future coming from my office. Well, I know the governor is putting out a lot of messaging on, uh, you know, I see PSAs on TV and other things coming out from the State Department of Health on measures they want people to continue to take. Uh, my concern, quite honestly, is for our healthcare partners right here who have said to me, Paul, we need, uh, 
we need some strong messaging to start to slow this thing down. And so that's, that's the reason why I'm somewhat angry and adamant today is I have healthcare partners that are saying, we need help. We need more to be done. Uh, and people will go right to masks and say, masks are the solution. Masks is, are one of 50 tools on this right now. And so thus me imploring the region to mask, social distance, hand hygiene, stay home if you're sick, if you're a vulnerable population, be smart, maybe skip church for a few weeks. I mean, all these different tools that will help to slow that down. I apologize in advance to you and my colleagues who have been in Chicago along the line of questions. Um, in World War II, my dad was between the ages of 8 and 12, and he clearly remembers at a time of great threat to our country that Americans and Nebraskans in his case came together, they planted victory gardens, uh, my grandmother knitted uh, bandages, she joined a, a group that would look and identify enemy aircraft. They had all sorts of uh, shifts through the day and through the week. Uh, my grandfather was a farmer who was exempt. He did what he did to help the country grow food. No one seemed to complain about that level of sacrifice. And are we South Dakotans? Are we just soft now? Are we, have we had it too easy for too long that we can't do a simple thing? Like I said, wear a mask. No, you're not going to get drafted into the military. Right. Is, is this a, besides a political thing, is this also a problem with our society? Well, I can't read that question back, for those of you who didn't hear it, but basically saying, what's the deal with our society that we can't take a simple action? And I kind of closed with it with some of my earlier comments that we're asking people to be unselfish in an increasingly selfish society. And that's just me being very blunt. Um, no one wants to do anything um, for other people. It's, it's increasingly becoming frustrating. So you're right. It's a very, th this is one of uh, several very simple actions. Um, but I think the larger challenge on this, if I'm being candid, is the politicization of this virus and how there are political responses that are Republican responses and there are political responses that are Democrat responses on how to take care of this virus. And that makes it very hard, very, very hard at the local nonpartisan level to lead through this. What about um, asking restaurants, you're going to have to put a law on this in effect, and asking restaurants, and I was a packed restaurant on the road, we wear masks, we're going to try to not, you know, no tables, we're distance. You know, we've got a uh, big visit event coming up this upcoming weekend where people travel from indoors together. I mean, how are you controlling that kind of thing? Well, one thing we're doing is we're starting an initiative. Um, a la good housekeeping seal of approval, where a restaurant, if they meet these requirements, meaning masks are required, check, uh, their staff require, is required to wear masks, there's hand sanity at every table, they'll get these check marks and they'll get a badge they can put in their door. So consumers can know that's a place I feel comfortable going. Uh, almost like they're recognized and they're appreciated for that work. So what I can do as the mayor is put out very strong messaging and model the way. I've done it with my 1,300 employees I think it's important enough that I'm doing it with my staff, and that's a trickle-down message that we're trying to get other employers uh, and residents to gravitate to, which is why I'm really doubling down on the severity right now. We were really good back in May and June when we didn't have to be, quite honestly, because we had projections that didn't hold. Well, now we're really in our Super Bowl right now, and people are tapped out because they used all their goodwill and their energy of good diligence four months too early. And so we're asking them to, now is the time when we really need you to be unselfish and do your part. I don't know the pro you'd have to ask the state on the protocol for the event. Uh, yeah, and right now that facility uh, has protocols, hand sanitizing protocols and things that they make available. But the events, there's no mandates on the convention center for what they can and can't have there. 
So we rely on the events that book there to take the precautions that their guests are wanting and asking for. So my assumption will be that there'll be proper protocols in place there uh, this coming weekend. So the question being asked is around uh, contact tracing of positive cases, and uh, are the healthcare systems able to provide any uh, assistance uh, with that? As there, per your uh, question, seems to be some gaps in, in the state process, and really we do rely on the State Department of Health. We have uh, privacy laws that. You know, it, it can make it challenging for us to navigate through that. So if uh, we, we do work closely with the state in regard to uh, employees that perhaps are, have some uh, symptoms and test positive, but it really uh, does come down to the state and uh, we're, we're willing to assist as, uh, as asked and, and have in the past. Yeah, I agree that we've recognized that, you know, just the pure number of cases that are turning positive right now are really becoming uh, stressful for the state to be able to contact trace. And one way that we are trying to help, because I agree it is primarily a state responsibility to train those individuals, but we are trying to help more kind of informally. So we've been talking a lot with our primary care physicians and other physicians at the time of, of testing and evaluation for testing. We're uh, scripting them to tell the patient at that time, okay, if you turn positive, it may be a while before the state uh, contacts you. So if you turn positive, you need to start thinking already about who have I been in close contact with, you know, six feet, 15 minutes, and uh, consider reaching out to those individuals to let them know that they've been, been exposed and that they need to isolate until, you know, to try to get a jump on that process. And so we're trying to do some of that scripting ahead of time in addition to when we do call back those positives, we do a little bit of that scripting as well. So formally, we can't do that, but we are trying to informally, you know, get some of that knowledge out there to the, to the individuals as they turn positive or as they get tested. So we do follow the CDC guidelines and those testing. Re so the question was, uh, what does it take to get tested in South Dakota? And so do you have to be symptomatic? Um, can you be a close contact? So we do follow the CDC guidelines uh, pretty closely for this. And so anybody that uh, has even mild degree of symptoms, we will test. And also anybody that's a close contact. So again, the close contact is back to that six feet for 15 minutes and so that is kind of our criteria anybody that fits those criteria we will go ahead and and test at this point we also commonly get the question of uh, if i think i might have been exposed should i wait a while before i get tested and the answer to that for the cdc is even though it may be more likely that you test positive later on we do want to get you tested just as soon as possible so we are not having you wait we're getting you tested just as soon as we can so we can get you out of circulation and not expose other people at that time. And that reminds me of one other thing. Earlier I mentioned we're opening up a second testing location at 23rd in Minnesota. I wanted to clarify as well that that's not going to be just a walk up or drive up location. You do need to talk to either your primary care physician or to the Avera hotline 877-AT-AVERA uh, to get that test order and get evaluated beforehand so that we can kind of uh, have, have that tracking in place beforehand and that we can do a lot of the uh, counseling of what to do if it's positive and negative, all those things. So please don't just show up if you see a line for, for testing. You do need to call first before you come. This is for the doctors. Uh, a week ago in this room, uh, Governor Nolan said that uh, the 
primary reason we're in this situation is not so much that we might not have the surge, but we're doing so much more testing and hence we're seeing more cases. Is she correct on the science and medicine on that? So the question was, um, it's been suggested that we're seeing so much of a surge right now, mainly because we're testing more people. So if you test more people, you find more people, essentially. Um, the, the answer to that is, is no. I think it's pretty clear we are seeing a true increase in cases and a couple of things that clearly point to that. One, the number of hospitalizations does not depend on how much you test. You know, you're going to get sick whether you get tested or don't get tested, and so the number of hospitalizations has, you know, doubled in the last month, and we're worried it's going to keep going up. And so that is clear evidence that we are seeing increased spread. Uh, two, you know, the percent positivity that you can track on the state level, that has continued to rise with a high level of test numbers. So yeah, you can mess with the percent positivity by testing more of this group or less of that group and stuff, but when both the test positivity and the number of test runs are both going up, um, if we were just uh, testing a bunch of people that were very low risk, we could drop the test positivity down, but the fact both of those are up also indicates we're in a, a true surging level. But the main one is hospitalizations, because that lags the number of cases by a good two or three weeks. And so the fact that we're seeing our numbers rise now means we're going to see hospitalizations continue to rise for at least the next several weeks. You can't fake being sick enough to be hospitalized. I, I would just add to that, we are you know, fortunate to be in an area where there is uh, good access to testing. And uh, I agree with Dr. Basil, that doesn't necessarily uh, have much to do in regard to hospitalizations. However, um, there, it absolutely is part of a mitigation strategy. He was talking about uh, testing asymptomatic individuals or individuals who have been exposed or, you know, frankly, anyone with uh, symptoms that in the past uh, perhaps we didn't pay a lot of attention to, now we're being tested. And so I think we're identifying a lot of positive uh, patients through that uh, enhanced ability to test. And it does certainly play some role in mitigation of uh, further spread so that if you know you're positive, you can appropriately isolate and things like that. And I realize there's exceptions to that, but I think it does provide an opportunity uh, and one of the tools in hopefully stopping the spread of this illness. All right, any, any other questions today? All right, so just a reminder, we'll have this uh, press conference in two weeks, but um, potentially if things change, we could have one sooner, so I'll keep your eye out for that. Uh, I want to, again, just before I close, these guys are incredible partners. we got incredible health care systems in our community, um, and I want to thank them for their work. People a lot of times ask me what experts I listen to, what blog. I listen to these guys. I listen to our local systems who know this market, who know what's happening here. And uh, we have great partners. So thank you for your partnership with this region. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.